man shot Walter Delacroix, raped Hope Percy, and stabbed her 17 times. In the courtroom at a sentencing, he was smiling and chewing his gum. He is an unfeeling, perverse misfit, and it is time. Well, Matthew, I made it. You've never done this before? No. You haven't been this close to a murderer before? Not that I know of. What is a nun doing in a place like this? In Hope House, een huisvestingsproject voor zwarte, kreeg zuster Helen Préjean de vraag of ze de geestelijke begeleidster wou worden van een ter dood veroordeelde gevangene. Ze woonde zijn executie bij en schreef over haar ervaring een boek dat verfilmd werd, Dead Man Walking. Sindsdien trekt ze de wereld rond in haar strijd tegen de doodstraf. Mag ik u voorstellen aan zuster Helen Préjean? You went to work in, in the field of capital punishment. Did this change your life? Yeah, and the way it happened, I was yeah. working at an adult learning center where people who were dropouts from high school were coming, and right around the corner was a prison coalition office. And one day, a friend, it was very casual, this conversation, asked me if I wanted to be a pen pal to somebody on death row. And I thought, yeah, sure. I thought I was just going to write letters. That's all I thought I was going to do. This was in 1982. We hadn't executed anybody in Louisiana since the 60s. And so I thought, I could write a few letters. Well, then one thing then, of course, led to the other. I wrote to this man, Elmo Patrick Sonier. I began to call him Patrick. And uh, he wrote back, and I noticed his humanness from the beginning. He didn't ask me for anything. He didn't try to con me out of anything. He was just so grateful someone had written to him. And then it all unfolded from there because he had no one to come and see him. His mother had been very shattered uh, emotionally by what had happened and uh, the trouble her sons had gotten into. And, she, you know, he and his brother had been convicted of killing a teenage couple. And, uh, she had to live in the town and hear people talking about her and she couldn't bear to go into the prison to see this place where they were going to kill her son. And so he was alone. And so the petal of the flower opened again like, I just wrote him, I'll come see you. And, and you did. I did. And little did I know when I drove the car, it's two and a half hours from New Orleans to this prison, how many times I would be going back to that prison and then bringing people with me, bringing people from the media, bringing people to do stories, you know. I had no idea. And first of all, I had no idea that he was even going to die. And then when you go to visit someone, they put you on their visitor list in their different categories, relative, spouse, friend. And he said, well, look, I'm a Catholic and you're a nun. Would you be my spiritual advisor? I said, sure. I didn't know that when he was going to be executed at midnight, at quarter to six in the evening in the death house, everybody leaves except the spiritual advisor, and that I would be able to be with him when he died. All of this was, to me, it's like God gives us this little pen light, a tiny little light, and we take it a step at a time. But, but each of the steps I took was solid under me. Once I visited with him, and I saw his humanness, and I saw death row, to see the sign, death row, to, to, to be in a neighborhood, to be in a place where people are held in cages, where they are going to be killed, shocked me completely. It, it, it was, it traumatized me. They call it stormy Monday, but Tuesday is Patrick's nightmare, and later I found out it was, it's everyone's nightmare on death row, is they're coming to get me. The execution squad is coming to my cell. They're stopping.
by my cell. They're coming for me. They're dragging me out of my cell. Uh, and I'm, I'm yelling, no, no, and I'm sweating. And then I wake up and I can't go back to sleep because conscious human beings, you can control your consciousness. You can't control your unconscious. Everybody has the same nightmare. I would have that nightmare too if I was being held in a place where people were going to kill me and, and, and they had given me the time or I don't know the time. And that's why you can't take the torture out of the death penalty because you can't take consciousness out of people and imagination. Albert Camus in Reflections on the Guillotine said that. Consciousness and imagination make people die a thousand times before you die. So at the end, no matter what the method, if, it's, if you're waiting on a gurney for lethal injection or electrocution or a bullet or gas or the rope, uh, the terror, of course, is having death thrust upon you against your will. Uh, that's the terror and that's the torture. Patrick, when he called me and he said they took me out of my cell and they weighed me on a scale and they measured me. And I said, hey, man, what you doing, you know? He's, he made a little joke like, is this a Weight Watchers program, a diet you're putting us on? They said nothing. They were silent. It was ominous. Uh, and then and so he said, we don't know why they're doing it. So what the guys on death row say is, well, they must be measuring us for our coffins. And I thought that I, I couldn't make sense of that. But only after Patrick had been killed, when I was talking to a warden one time, I asked about that. And he said, oh, no, no, it's uh, because uh, some of these guys, you know, are pretty big. And so and the, the guys have to practice. And so they're gonna, they want to get a guard of his height and build so they can practice. And then that's when I found out how that worked, why they did that. When you realized that you were going to witness his execution, were you never afraid? Didn't you ever want to stop? Well, it was, it was terrifying to be, see, part of the protocol, too, is he was moved to the death house where he's put in a holding cell, and I could visit with him there. He was, there was a metal door locked with a mesh screen. He was on one side, I was on the other. And three days before his death, now, of course, I kept being buoyed up by a hope that something would happen, all right? But to walk into the place. There's a guard on the outside with a rifle. There's a person with a rifle on the inside. It's like arming yourself and arming yourself to kill this man. You could just see the violence all around you. And walking into the death house too, where, where the visit was, there, there was a generator on the outside of the building to, to give the electricity for the electric chair. Because in their planning for death, they wanted to make sure nobody could stop the execution. So they're always thinking, what if inmates would try to turn off, or people protesting would try to turn off the electricity. So there's the generator. And growing right outside the door were the red geranium plants. Flowers are planted outside the death house. So there was life and everything seeming normal. And you step into the building, the tiles polished. Uh, that made it even more terrifying to me because it looked so normal. And then as we get closer to the night of execution, the secretary comes in and you hear her typing and it sounds like a business office, but she's typing the forms that the witnesses will sign after they have witnessed his death. And then in the afternoon, as the execution is approaching, it'll be at midnight that night, the place gets busier the doors opening and closing. The electrician comes in to check the chair, the electric chair, to see that it's working. The lights dim. You see the dimming lights. You know he's checking the electric chair. Um, they were kind to me, to Pat. They'd come, Patrick, do you need any more coffee? Uh, do you need cigarettes? Uh, the same people that were going to kill yeah, him. Yeah, they were all part of this team. You know, and one of the profound things that's made me realize is one of the reasons we must abolish the death penalty it is it involves good people. 
in the execution of their fellow human beings. Uh, only later, after Patrick's death, did I meet someone who was the supervisor on death row, but also part of this execution squad, who told me, I've been through five of these executions and I can't take it anymore. I don't sleep. I can't eat. I know what they've done is wrong, but when you're close to it like this and know that you're killing a fellow human being who's, who's defenseless, I can't square it with my conscience anymore. And I began to meet some of these guards in the death house um, who would look at me like one pulled me close and said, Sister, uh, I don't really want to be here, you know what I mean? But he said, I got a wife and kids, you know, it's like part of my job. And so, so then it comes to the day of the death. And of course, Patrick had been through a crucible uh, of change himself. Most people, when they are brought into prison, after a life of chaos and drugs and alcohol and violence, and you put in a cell, you, in a way you become like a monk. For the first time he read books. For the first time he began to reflect on the scriptures. For the first time he met someone like me who could show him love, who could help him get in touch and develop parts of his life he had never had before. And then we kill him. It's such an act of despair to have executions because it's like totally despairing that human beings can be restored and can change. And um, so Patrick and I now, two years of visiting with him, I, I understand him, I feel close to him. And of course he's very nervous, he's trying to be very brave. His big thing was, I'm not gonna break in front of them. Uh, my prayer, I was terrified. Uh, in the movie, they have a scene of my going into the women's room. That was the only private place in the death house because guards, they are swarming all around me, all of these men. Uh, and the woman's, women's room was the only place. And I remember going in there and grabbing my cross and being so scared. And my prayer was, it was a selfish prayer, I guess, like, God, please don't let him break down emotionally because I don't know what I'll do if he falls apart. I know I was hanging by a thread emotionally myself, and we would give each other strength, and he would say, Sister Helen, are you okay? And I'd say, yeah, Patrick, God's here with us. And then we'd put our hands against that mesh screen, and we would pray together. And his great dignity, the suffering of the, the you know, the execution of a human being is such a, relentless process of trying to take his dignity away. I mean, the, the attitude being toward him, you are such scum, you are disposable human waste that we are going to kill you. And then uh, the last meal, uh, he ate it. They, I, couldn't, I couldn't get my throat to work. I, couldn't, I could swallow a little bit deep. He did it, they're not going to break me, so he ate his last meal. Um, and then the guards came in to prepare his body for execution. And uh, they took him in the cell. He disappeared from my view. I was walking up and down, uh, waiting. Uh, as they shaved his hair and his eyebrows, um, cut the pants leg of his left, the left pants leg of his blue jeans, and shaved around the calf of his ankle where Why the electrode because it's by electrocution, they don't want the hair to catch on fire. So they shave their heads, um, and then the calf of his leg is where and the electrode would be connected, because he must be grounded for the electricity to work. And um, in a, I kept feeling like I, I must be in a hospital, because they're following a protocol, and they're doing, but the end result is not to save life. And it was, every time I would come up against it, it was jarring. It was terrifying. It's what made it so terrifying because it felt normal and, and somehow all of this is about life. This can't be that at midnight they're going to kill him. And then when they brought him out afterwards, he, he looked like a, you know, like a little bird without feathers. It was like shorn of his hair. Uh, 
and he was he was afraid. He he lost his strength for one moment there as he approached the chair where he was going to sit. He lost the strength in his legs, and he fell down on one knee. Uh, and he looked up at me, and he said, "Sister Helen, I'm going to die." And I remember the strength came forth from me to be with him. I remember the strength in me. Uh, and I put my hands against that screen because it's as close as I could get to him. And I, I just said, Patrick, Patrick, you're a human being. You're a son of God. And there's a dignity no one can take from you. And then, uh, then the time, the time is like no other time. It was like it was standing still and it's like it was racing. And I didn't want to look at my watch in front of him. I just tried to be totally present to him. And uh, he was Catholic, and uh, a priest had come. He had gone to confession. He had, we had received communion together. Um, and he, he said to me then, Sister Helen, you can't, I don't want you to be there at the very end because it could scar you psychologically to watch this. And I'm looking in his eyes, and he's terrified. And all I knew was, I absolutely knew, and I said to him, Patrick, there is no way you were going to die alone. You look at me. You look at my face, and I will be the face of Christ for you. I remember the strength. After he was executed, I read about an execution. I had to sit down because all the strength left my legs. But when you're in it, I was in it, and I was strong. And so I was there for him. I'm sure that's why I was so strong. Because at a time like that, you leave yourself whatever you need, and you're there. And uh, so he consented then that I could be there. And I said, uh, Patrick, I have love. I have a community. Uh, people will take care of me. I will be all right. You look at me. You look at my face. So he had consented then. And then the hours tick by. And then uh, it's midnight then. And here's the warden. I felt like it was a script, because you know exactly it is a scripted death. You know everything that's going to happen. And uh, he gave me his Bible. He made a gift of his Bible to me. Uh, I don't know if this is the time to talk about it. Um, he, um, you know, there are Bibles and there are Bibles. Uh, this one is thumb through the Psalms, the prayers underlined. This was a man who prayed uh, and who found God on death row, who dealt with his own guilt, uh, his own remorse for participating in the death of two teenage kids. He started uh, in prison <clears throat> reading the Bible, or did he? No, I think in his family it had been part of it, but then, of course, much more intensely. Uh, one of the, the Psalms that, that really struck me after I got this book that I had prayed with before but never noticed it like this one. Um, in, uh, in Psalm 31, uh, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me. You are my rock. Be my strong rock. On you I stand. Uh, they plot to take my life but you are my rock. They plot to take my life, though it was all around him, the, the design, the plan to take his life. And so right before, as they were about to lead him out, he, um, he wrote in the Bible, he gave me this gift um, and said, Lord, I give this holy Bible to the one I love so dearly, and I love her with all my heart and soul, for she is Sister Helen Prejean. Then he wrote the, the date, and then he signed his name. And then, you he know... He wrote his own date of, of death when he was going to yes. die. Yes. In, in a Bible, you know, you have marriages and baptisms and deaths and births. And on the, the, uh, the, the page where it has deaths, different people in his family that he had written, and then he wrote his own name, Elmo P. Saunier. April 4th, 1984, actually the date of his death on the certificate would be April 5th because right after midnight they killed him. But, um, so he handed me this Bible, I held this Bible, and, uh, and then read to him from it as we walked. And as he was let out, he asked the warden, he said, 
His voice was husky like a child's. Uh, he's, I guess he was trying to control his voice, but he said, Warden, uh, can I ask you one question? Can Sister Helen touch my arm? And the, war and the warden had nodded his head like this, and he's surrounded by all these guards, you know. And for the first time, I touched him. For the uh, first time? Yes, you were never allowed to touch. Uh, and I put my hand on his shoulder. I realized how tall he was. We always were visiting in these cramped situations where he was always sitting, and, uh, and read to him then from Isaiah 43, I have called you by your name, you are mine. I wanted words from the scriptures to give him a sense of his dignity and God's love for him, even though they were doing this thing to him. And uh, so we walked together to the electric chair where it was, and, uh, and then the guards took me by either arm because they actually let me walk into the execution chamber with him. Now they don't let you do that. But this was the third execution. This was in 1984. We had resumed executions in 83. It was only the third one. Uh, so they let me get in closer than later they would let other people. Um, and then the guards took me by either arm to lead me out. And I leaned over and I kissed him on the back. And I said, Patrick, pray for me. I really meant remember me to God. You asked him to pray for you. Yes. And, uh, and then they, I had to go and sit with the witnesses, and then the warden asked him if he had any last words. And he had, he, all the people I had been with, they really work on their last words. What are the last words I am going to say? And he had, he had gone through feelings of anger. Uh, it's a very complicated case. Uh, he and his brother had been involved in the abduction and rape and killing of, of a teenage couple. And in truth, his brother had been the one who had shot and killed the kids. But he felt, I think, as guilty as if he had because he knew he was involved in doing shameful things with the abduction of these kids and this, these rapes. And, uh, but at any rate, he... Uh, he, he had to go through these feelings because he wanted to express his anger at the kind of defense he had no lawyer. I mean, he had a lawyer who was so, so, I mean, he only visited with him for two half-hour periods to prepare his whole defense. It was like such, so he had a lot of feelings. And we were talking about that, and I had said to him, Patrick, they're the last words of your life, and you get to choose if they'll be words of anger and hate, or if there'll be words of love. And uh, I didn't try to give him what his words should be, of course not. I respected whatever he would choose to say. And so when they asked him, he asked forgiveness for, you know, what had happened uh, to the victims' families. And, uh, and he said, almost matter-of-factly, but Eddie done it, he said. And then he walked to the chair they worked very quickly, and they were strapping him in. Uh, and the last thing they do is to put a mask over his face, because when all that electricity hits a person's body, they were trying to protect the witnesses. But before they put that mask on his face, they had strapped his arms, strapped his trunk, his legs, uh, put this metal plate cap on his head to, and connected it to all the electricity. Uh, before they put that mask, he saw my face, and he looked at me, and his last words were to me. And he mouthed with his lips, I love you. And I remember my hand going out toward him uh, and saying, I love you too. Uh, and then they I knew he couldn't see me anymore, and uh, I uh, closed my eyes and heard as they clanged the switch. Um, and his body convulsing with all the electricity. And uh, so then when I did look up, he, uh, one hand had grasped the chair, the other, the fingers were curled upward. Um, and the doctor came and put that little pen light into his eyes, and he wasn't seeing anymore, no more heartbeat. And, and I walked out of that execution chamber. I mean, uh, the sisters were waiting and friends and they embraced me. I was so cold. I remember being so cold. Uh, 
and then we had to, we were driving away and we had to stop the car because I had to to vomit. I just threw up. It was like it what I had seen. And then I, when I the whole week afterwards, I began to cry and cry and cry like I was thawing out from the horror of it all, and began to pick it up and to tell the story. I never dreamed how many times I would be telling this man's story. But I had learned along the way about the death penalty with this man. And, uh, and now I tell this story all over this country and all over the world. Politicians are using victims' families to legitimize the death penalty. They never tell people how selective the death penalty is. Is it? Very. I mean, when you, when you consider that since 1965, we have had close to 600,000 homicides in the United States. And when you look at, in 1998, 3,300 people sit on death row. It's a very selective process. And when you look and see who gets chosen for death, uh, almost always it's people who have killed white people. Uh, people of color are 50% of all homicide victims in this country. But it's rare when the death penalty is sought, ever sought, for a white person who has killed a person of color. Or even when a person of color kills another person of color. If the victim's not prized, there's no outrage over their death. It's accepted as, as just a matter of course. And so the truth is in this country that to get the death penalty, you gotta kill a white person because white life is much more highly prized than the life of people of color. And that selectivity is built into the death penalty from square one. Who was the victim and who cares? And then a lot of times it just comes down to what's the geographical location? Where did you do it? Jeffrey Dahmer killed people and ate them, but he did it in Wisconsin where they didn't have the death penalty. If you do a murder in Houston, Texas, where this DA, District Attorney Johnny Holmes, goes for the death penalty every chance he gets. Uh, there are seven women on death row in Texas. Half of them are there because of Johnny Holmes. One third of all the people are there because of Johnny Holmes. Whereas right down the road in Dallas, Texas, is a district attorney who doesn't pursue the death penalty half as much. So you have all this discretionary power from the district attorneys who decide if you're going to go for the death penalty or you're not. And so then you introduce the element of arbitrariness and capriciousness that is as present in the death penalty today as it was in 1972 when the U.S. Supreme Court overturned it because it was arbitrary and capricious in the Furman v. Georgia decision. The court, though, is political, and the court does not have the heart or the conscience to acknowledge that the death penalty is cruelty, which is against the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, or that it's every bit as arbitrary and capricious as it's always been. Politics enters into this, to the, to the upholding of the death penalty. And courts, of course, are political. You told me, Mama, once upon a time, you said it's gonna be yours. You said that you be mine, but that's all right. What is, according to you, the most important, the most urgent problem in present-day society? The most important thing is that we have to learn how to live as a community. In the United States, we're very separated from each other. For example, people get most of their information about each other from TV. And TV is sound bites and stereotypical images. We need to build neighborhoods 
We need to have people meeting each other in person and doing things. Uh, there's a lot of separation. And then, of course, the way that the TV people do the news is no matter how many peaceful things go on in New Orleans today, tonight on the evening news, they're going to ferret out whatever acts of violence were in this city. So people begin to have a heightened sense of violence. They begin to see violence everywhere, and they begin to be afraid. And so then they avoid certain neighborhoods, certain groups of people. Fear makes people isolate, be with groups just like them. Uh, churches contribute to this too, like Martin Luther King said, the most segregated hour of the week in the United States is on Sunday morning when people go to church. So neighborhoods, community, the building of community, because when people meet each other, see each other, then you can begin to talk about well, justice and what are we going to do about the economy and why can't people get these jobs. Compassion can be present when you know real people. If you only know stereotypical images, then you, you're afraid of them, you judge them in a very shallow way, and you can be very harsh toward them. Yes, we must punish those people because I have to protect my way of life, these people I know with the people just like me. And uh, so the building a community is essential. What is, according to you, the role of religion or of church in the 21st century? See, religion, the word means to bind. Uh, now, sometimes that's been, it means to bind by rules and laws and dogmas. But to me, the binding, the essential binding, needs to be people to people. Everyone is my brother. Everyone is my sister. And then to live out of that. We all believe we have to be kind to our neighbor, only we get very selective about who our neighbor is. And finally it boils down to, oh, well it's the folks just like me. And Jesus, all religions challenge us to cross those lines and to be with people not like us, to cross uh, the lines of economy, and, uh, social class and color and all those things. Well, Sister Helen, I think you have surely crossed the line to death row inmates. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.